for those of you joining. Um, as you can see in the chat, we're sharing where we're all um, joining from. So thanks for doing that. Hello and welcome again, everyone. Um, sorry. Thank you so much for joining today's training on trauma-informed understanding of mental health and psychosocial support. Um, I'd like to start by mentioning that today's training will run for one hour and 30 minutes and that it's being recorded. You'll be emailed a link to the recording along with the recommended resource um, in about 24 hours. This training is presented by Switchboard, a one-stop resource hub for refugee service providers in the United States. My name is Tegas Coleman, and I am Switchboard's training officer. I'm joined by a co-host today, Rebecca Milquinn. You'll be hearing from Rebecca in the chat throughout today's training. As most of you know, this webinar is part of Switchboard's online certificate course currently taking place through September 1st. We received an overwhelming interest for a limited space, so we decided to make this particular learning opportunity publicly available via this webinar. We would like to mention that we'll be publicly releasing many of the course materials shortly um, after the course concludes. So if you haven't already, please subscribe to Switchboard so that you can receive these uh, materials and future training opportunities. Before we start, we want to take to, um, this time to recognize the distressing events happening in Lebanon and Afghanistan. We want to recognize that we may have some of you on this call that are impacted and or your families are impacted and just really keeping the community in our hearts. So I just wanted to take um, a minute to recognize and also just send our positive thoughts. Before we dive into our training, I'd like to go over a few logistics in Zoom. All attendees are currently muted and are joined in listen-only mode. If you're having any trouble, you can switch between phone and computer audio at any time. You'll find the audio settings in the bottom left corner of your screen. We welcome your comments, discussions, and engagements throughout today's session via chat. To open chat, click the chat bubble icon in the bottom center of your screen. Please send your messages to all panelists and attendees so that we're all able to view your message. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of today's session, but would also like to um, hear from you throughout. You can type your questions by clicking on the Q&A button. If you see a submitted question that you'd also like answered, feel free to upvote it by clicking the thumbs up next to the question. We have received some really, really good questions from some of you during the pre-registration, which we hope the webinar can cover and address. I am beyond thrilled to be here with you today with our two amazing speakers, Beth Farmer and Dr. Susan Song. Again, my name is Tigus Coleman, and I am a licensed clinical social worker with over 18 years of experience working with refugees, um, immigrants, and um, other forcefully, forcefully um, displaced um, population in direct service, supervisory, and management positions. Prior to joining Switchboard, I was with Lutheran Community Services in the Seattle office in OR's Unaccompanied Refugee Minor Program. This field holds a very special place in my heart as my professional work was founded on the intimate journey that my family experienced as a refugee and immigrant while also recognize, recognizing and acknowledging that my experience is limited and isn't a blanket um, application to the unique, unique experiences of others. With me today, I have Beth, who is a licensed cl clinical social worker with over three decades of experience working with marginalized and vulnerable population, including over a decade of experience in, in the field of refugee mental health she has helped design and deliver holistic integrated programming to survivors of torture, asylum seekers, returning prisoners of war, and unaccompanied refugee minors. Beth currently serves at, um, as IRC Senior Technical Advisor, Safety, Education, and Wellness within the Resettlement Asylum, asylum and Integrated um, Unit. Dr. Susan Song is the 
Director of Child, Adolescent and Family Psychiatry at George Washington University Medical Center. She provides consultation on refugee mental health with a, special, a specialization in issue including depression, anxiety, grief, life transitions, relationships, and schoolwork stress. With a public health background, Dr. Song's holistic approach includes incorporating family relationships and schoolwork information into the life of each person and encourages clients to be active participants in treatment. Our proposed learning um, object objective today is that by the end of today's webinar, you will be able to identify core concepts related to mental health, psychosocial support, or the acronym that you'll be hearing from here on as MHBSS, pertaining to resettlement context, understand the impact of pre and post migration traumas on the health and well being of forced migration, apply guiding principles principles of trauma informed and culturally responsive practices in your work. And finally, describe the current climate of refugee service and its impact on the health and well-being of refugees, asylees, and forced migrants. Well, we know that mental health is a term that's used very, very frequently. Uh, but have you ever sat down and thought about what mental health and wellness mean to you? How would you describe it? We would love your, um, your answers in the chat button. So if you can give us your responses in the chat and be sure to send your answers to all panelists and attendees so that we're able to see um, your answers, that would be great. So really just in your own um, words, how or what does mental health and wellness mean to you? I see some Answers coming in, setting boundaries and, yep, setting boundaries, body, mind, and spirit and balance of the good of individual, the ability to recognize one's needs and process, ch and process challenges safely, feeling good in your heart and in your mind. These are really, really good questions, um, answers that are coming in. Holistic, someone says. health, balance, feeling balanced. Sounds like that's a, a pattern that we're seeing. Healthy in our thoughts and the stress level. Keep coming, keep um, sending the, the answers. Thank you so much. As most of you stated in your answers, mental health and wellness is defined, viewed, and applied very differently. Mental health includes our emotional, Psycho, psycho, psychological and also social well-being. It affects how we think, how we feel, and how we act. It also helps determine how we handle stress related, related you know, also relate to others and make choices. Mental health is important at every stage of life, from childhood, adolescence, through adulthood. Positive mental health is related to mental and psychosocial well-being. It's important to note that having good mental health or being mentally healthy is more than just the absence of um, illness. Rather, it's a state of overall um, well-being. It's also important to note that the ways we conceptualize, talk about, and act on uh, mental health are heavily influenced by culture, which we'll get into a little later in the webinar. I see the answers are um, coming in. So feel free to go in the chat and read um, what your, your fellow colleagues are saying. Now, what do we mean by well-being? The definition of mental health often includes several interrelated yet very distinct um, concepts. One key concept is well-being, the positive state of being, which a person thrives in. In MHPSS work, well-being is often um, understood in terms of three domains. First, it's the personal well-being. That is the positive thoughts, the emotions, such as hopefulness, calm, self-esteem, and self-confidence. Second, it's the interpersonal well-being, nurturing relationships that you have, a sense of belonging, that connectedness with the community, the ability to be close to others, to families, to friends, 
And third, it's the skills and knowledge. That is the capacity to learn, make self-informed decisions, effectively respond to stress. Therefore, psychosocial is the recognition that we do not exist as entities separate from the world around us. Our opportunities, relationships, ability to meet basic needs, participate in society, learn, and so much more impacts our mental health. Conversely, our mental health impacts our ability to seize those opportunities from relationships, participation in society, and so on. This is a bi-directional relationship, meaning it goes both ways. It's also dynamic relationship, meaning it also changes um, all the time. That said, we would love to get a poll on, the, um, on this question of, is mental health only associated with the negative aspects of our well-being? Let's see. We're seeing lots of lots of answers coming in. Thank you for participating. Just a few more seconds. Perfect. So I think most of you have um, answered the question correctly, which is that no, it is not. Everybody has mental health and it's as important as physical health. As we mentioned above, having good health or being mentally healthy is more than just the absence of illness. Rather, it's a state of overall well-being. It's best to think about mental health as a continuum rather than seeing people as mentally ill or mentally well. Most people move up and down this continuum due to the factors in our lives, such as our genetic predispositions, individual habits that we might have, external life circumstances and stresses that we might be under. When we have good mental health, we can cope with the normal pressures of life. We can work productively. We can make contributions to our friends and our community. We can build and maintain good relationships. As humans, we have some days, we all have some days when we're fearful, angry, anxious, wor worried, or even sad. And sometimes this emotions can persist until we feel helpless, overwhelmed, or out of control. We might have the difficulty um, concentrating, sleeping, and making decisions. When the length and intensity of this symptoms start having negative impacts, then that's when we should be a little worried. The aim of most mental health interventions are to move people up the continuum so that they reach their full potential life, um, satisfying lives. Therefore, the term mental health and psychosocial support, MHPSS, refers to the state of emotional, behavioral, and cognitive health, and all the factors that it impacts, right? So in refugee resettlement context, this broad definition of mental health and psychosocial support refers to a range of activities that address the psychological and social impacts of conflict and forced displacement. It's important to note that this model of MHPSS has roots in a wide and also very Western cultural worldview. World it incorporates mind-body dualism, the concept that mind and body are just two separate entities. However, many cultures like my own have different models of mental health, including spiritual and historical. Most cultures with holistic medicine consider the mind and body to be the same and have worked really well towards integrating their management. The National Partnership for Community Training has developed several refugee wellness country guides which discuss cultural expressions of mental health. And another great resource that you might find helpful is um, Ethnomed. I know Rebecca is gonna put the links in the chat if you want to reference um, or if you want to refer to those guides that I just mentioned. I'm now going to hand it off to Beth to give us a little more context on how we conceptualize this work with the Interagency Standing Committee Pyramid. Beth? Thanks so much for having me, Tigist. 
Um, I'm so appreciative of being here. Um, Tigus gave us a great definition of what do we mean by um, mental health and psychosocial and what does that MHPSS um, term mean? She also talked about the fact that there's lots of ways to conceptualize mental health um, and that can differ across culture, it can differ across age, and it can even differ across um, gender. However, I think it's important to know the most common way that MHPSS work is conceptualized within the humanitarian or refugee resettlement field. And that frame of the work, that frame of MHPSS work is most often based on the Interagency Standing Committee Pyramid. And the Interagent Standing Committee is a UN coordinating body, and it has specialty areas of which MHPSS is one. And I think this intervention, this pyramid that they use um, for their work, and which guides a lot of the work in the refugee field, is important to know because I think it recognizes the important role that every single person that is working in this field has in promoting positive mental health. So the IASC MHPSS pyramid um, first recognizes that we really need to have safety and security first as a priority and to restore mental health to the extent that it can. And so when people are doing things that provide that safety and security, um, protect, protect dignity, provide for those very basic needs, they are in essence helping restore mental health. As we move up that pyramid, we also recognize that people need family and community support. So any type of programming and intervention that is helping strengthening families, connecting families, helping people create connections in their community is also um, promoting mental health. Then we go up to the next level of the pyramid, and this is where things get a little bit more specialized, which is when we're looking at group, family, individual interventions that may be more focused on a particular topic, let's say parenting in a new country, or um, people with chronic medical illnesses, or single mothers, right? Any of these kind of focused, um, support is that next level. And then at the very top is individual counseling, psychiatric treatment, medication management, which is those really specialized services by trained mental health professionals. You'll notice that those specialty services are a tiny portion of mental health promotion and restoration that the vast majority of mental health work really occurs at this bottom of the pyramid. Now people can enter this pyramid at any place and they can move up and down it or even be in two places at the same time. They can be in community support groups and receiving individual and family services. But it often, this also recognizes that the more that we can help promote and restore mental health at the bottom levels of this pyramid, the more sustainable and culturally congruent it is likely to be. Next slide. So throughout all four layers of those pyramids, there really is a through line. And that's where that trauma informed comes in. And I know Dr. Song will be speaking about trauma a little bit more later, but in all four layers, we are seeking to do things like promote safety and trust promote connection and belonging, helping people reflect on what's going on for them, promoting coping strategies, promoting help-seeking behavior. All of this is happening at all four layers to at differing levels. Can move on. 
So one question based on having just seen this pyramid and how we conceive of MHPSS work, a quick poll question. When someone's experiencing a non-acute mental health issue, do they need to see a provider? Do they always need to see a provider? I'd love to know what you all think. Great. And all right. So it looks like the vast majority of you all said no. And that is correct. And the reason why I really wanted this question in there is because often we think when people are experiencing emotional distress or mental health issues, the only tool in our toolbox is individual counseling or psychiatric services or medication. And that's just not true. We have a lot of tools in our toolbox that we can use. And we know in many communities, the mental health resources are scarce and even more scarce um, if we are looking for linguistically accessible and culturally congruent services. So we need to know that there's other tools that we can bring to the table to help promote positive mental health and restore positive mental health. So now we've talked a little bit about how we frame or conceptualize mental health in a large part of the work, but I also want to talk about the key approaches that we use in all of this work. And again, this is a through line throughout all of the different services that we will offer and all of the roles that we may play. And those key principles or key approaches are that we should focus on people's strengths, not just their deficits. They may be experiencing challenges um, for very good reason. They may be struggling for very good reason, but everyone we serve is a survivor and they've gotten here and they have tremendous, tremendous strengths. And the way back to that positive mental health or that state of well being is to utilize and bring forth those strengths, to restore those strengths or remind people of those strengths. That's going to be our best way forward. We also want to look at everything we do from the socio-ecological perspective. We have to, given that pyramid, we have to look at where our priorities are on that pyramid. If somebody is facing eviction, doing trauma-focused therapy may not be appropriate at that time. They may need that safety and stability first. So as we look at people's service plans or cases, we can't separate mental health out from everything else that is going on in their lives. It must be considered as a whole and we must look at it from a prioritization standpoint. We always, always want to do no harm. And that means that if we're not trained to do something, and if it's outside of our scope and our role, we want to be really careful on whether we're actually doing it or not. And so doing no harm sometimes means that it's better to do nothing than to do something that we're not trained or don't have the resources to do. We want to have that trauma-informed approach that seeks to restore a sense of empowerment, safety, mutuality in all of the work that we do. And Switchboard has some excellent trauma-informed care trainings that uh, Rebecca can point you to that if you want to do a deep dive into trauma-informed care. We also want to heavily respect the fact that there our clients are the best reporter of what is going on for them, what has happened to them, and what is meaningful to them and what they want in the future. 
We don't get to decide that for our clients. They get to decide that for themselves, which means that we have to be really careful about the assumptions we make, the bias that may come into our work, and we have to really center ourselves on what clients want and say is meaningful. And the last key approach or principle that goes throughout all of our work is to consider the culture that people come from. And cultures are not monolithic and they're not static. I have a very different culture than my grandmother. Um, and she has a very different culture than her grandmother. It changes by generation. It changes whether you are in uh, urban or rural areas by education. And people can carry many different cultures at the same time because people may be part of many different cultures at the same time. And so we can't just think about a culture as a country. We have to, again, go back to that client-centered care and we have to really know the landscape of that particular possibly religion or ethnic group, but we have to ask that individual about themselves. And so we need to be deeply, deeply responsive to that individual and how they define their identity and how they define their culture. And I'm going to turn it over here to Dr. Song to talk more about trauma. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, everybody, for, for joining us today. Um, so I will go next into the section around what is trauma-informed approaches and how do we um, use that with our refugee populations. Just to give a little bit more background about where I'm coming from in the background of this part, the section. Um, so I am a child and adult psychiatrist. Uh, so I have a, my heart is as a clinician. I was medical director of a survivor of torture clinic for a number of years. And right now I have a clinic seeing um, survivors of hostage trafficking and torture. Um, I'm also a humanitarian protection advisor and MHPSS advisor. So I work for at the MHPSS collaborative for Save the Children. And with them, I'm doing a project right now for UNICEF, which we can talk about later. Um, in my past, I was with UNHCR. So while we're talking about this, we can think of it both from a systems level and advocacy policy, the systems that affect the people that you're working with, as well as from the clinical level. So when we think about trauma, what do you think of? What words, what images come to mind? Trauma doesn't have one definition, but it does have so many common aspects. We know that trauma impacts people. Yes, it can be scary, unsafe. It can have physical impacts like an injury and also the emotional impacts that can be short or long-term. So trauma often changes how people think about the world, how they think about themselves and about others. Because the trauma response, the fight, flight, or freeze response, it is hardwired and physiological in nature. So people can have these traumatic responses long after the trauma has happened. So I tend to think of trauma as an adjective, not a noun. It's a subjective experience. It's not an event. You and I could be in the same car accident. I could walk away extremely affected for the rest of my life, right? Avoiding cars, highways, never getting, stepping foot into a vehicle again. You could walk away just fine, right? Not all people who experience migration and loss will have a traumatic experience, which are deeply disturbing, frightening. Um, so what may be traumatic to one may not be traumatic to another. Next slide. So traditionally the refugee experience is divided into three categories, the pre-flight, flight, and the resettlement. This triple trauma paradigm acknowledges the traumatic experiences that can happen during each of these phases. So pre-flight is the fear that builds up over time as you decide it's time to leave home. The flight and displacement is running from home, time in refugee camps, etc. And then resettlement is when we land in the host or home country, the final destination. If you're in the US, there is a final destination, but, but mindful that many people across the world, there is no resettlement. They're, they're still moving from place to place. So people come here with many expectations and they're often disappointed. So housing may be unsafe. The systems are difficult to navigate. If you think about 
if any of you were born in this country, it's still hard for us to understand the healthcare system, how to figure out the educational system, right? For newcomers, the language may be problematic because people associate English proficiency with intelligence. It's hard to find a job, there's culture shock, right? People are reconstituting their image of who they are in this new place. And they're stripped of their economic, social capital, as well as the social system that supported them. So these phases all interact. While the refugee experience is a very varied, so some migrate on foot, others in an airplane, some migrate alone, others migrate with family. But refugees generally experience some of these emotional challenges, like feeling rejected by the community that they come to, and that reinforces a perceived sense of constant threat. They can feel kind of unrooted, which makes it harder to integrate. There's grief for those who are left behind, preoccupation with the well being of those left behind, and then, of course, traumatic loss of loved ones. Right? So when people are feeling really disappointed, disempowered, feeling ashamed, feeling guilty, these are normal reactions. And if they're left unsupported, they can lead to a host of mental health problems like suicidal thoughts, family violence, harmful coping like drug or alcohol misuse. But studies show the majority of refugees do not develop a trauma disorder. And even without treatment, most trauma symptoms improve over time. So people aren't just passive recipients of what's happened to them. They react, adjust, they manage, they make meaning. And this means that sometimes they can also grow. They develop a deeper sense of connection with themselves, with the world. They're proud of what they've endured. This growth doesn't take away from the trauma, nor does it mean the trauma didn't negatively impact them. Both can exist at the same time. Next slide. So, for a question for you all, do you all believe that all refugees need men mental health support? And you can just click on the answers. Okay, so interesting. We're kind of at an, an even split of yes and no. Great. Okay, so actually all refugees don't need mental health support um, because we can use a trauma-informed MHPSS approach to facilitate people feeling safe, feeling like they understand the systems that are clear, transparent, they're trustworthy, we want people to feel the clients connected to others with kind of mutual collaborative relationships. And we want individuals to feel they have the power to make the decisions that are best for themselves and for their families of whether or not they need formal mental health support. Next slide. So a strengths-based approach recognizes that all people have inherent strengths, including their lived experience, their talents, their knowledge. We're trying to recognize and promote the strengths, amplify the assets, as opposed to deficits. Now, for the clinicians, there's a tendency to focus on the problems, right? That's why people come. But we also have to rebalance to understand that people have, of course, the capacity to grow and change. We all have a range of internal and external assets and resources that contribute to our resiliency. So our job is to help people, especially when they're feeling really down, or especially when they're feeling really stressed and hard on themselves. Part of our job is to help pull out that other side, that strength-based side, right? So they can fully participate in the available supports and services that are available. Okay, a brief word of caution that while we always want to start from a place of acknowledging strengths and not deficits, there are of course times that extreme distress or mental health, mental health issues will require a clinical referral. Next slide. So a trauma-informed approach means being client-centered. Now we all probably think, of course, we're putting the client first. But we have to ask ourselves truly, honestly, are we? 
Client-centered care means clients are the best people to decide their own goals and priorities. They are the most reliable reporters of their history, and they should determine which programs and processes meet their needs. So we empower people, we give them a choice, we foster collaboration, help them come up with a plan of care that reflects their priorities and wishes and choices. And just think for yourself, when you're the last client that you saw, how empowered do you think they felt to really plan their own treatment plan or, or plan of action? Client-centered care is responsive and it changes as the needs and wishes and the context change. It can vary across the lifespan. We think about the evolving capacity of kids as they age. We also recognize the important roles and responsibilities of caregivers. Okay, the next Dr. slide, please. Dr. Song, can I, um, mm. can I flag a question that just came in through the chat? Um, sure. It says, if mental health is not defined by negative symptoms alone, but also positive functioning and adaptation, shouldn't it be necessary for all? Should mental health, um, should so mental health. Mental, it, so if mental health is not defined by negative symptoms alone, but also positive um, functioning, should it be, should it, should, should it be ne necessary for everyone to have it, that is? Yeah, so should, should mental health be ne necessary? I'm wondering what the it is. Mental health um, treatment and support be necessary um, for all? I'm assuming that it's probably what they're referring to. The reason, yeah. Yeah. So we think that, so back to what Beth was talking about with the I Ask Pyramid, um, there are different levels of support and interventions that people need. So yes, you're right. Mental health is defined not only by the, the difficult problems and symptoms, but also by the supportive resilience that we all have. We need that throughout all layers of the system. Right. So not, but not everybody will need the, let's say the tip of the pyramid type, the, the most severe cases, right. The ones that need very targeted, like a psychiatrist or psychologist, very specialized treatment. Not everybody needs that care. So we really have to think about where do we, where do our clients, where do they land within that pyramid? And of course people will go in, in and out um, throughout those levels but not all, not all refugees, just as they won't all have the same traumatic experience, both intensity, severity, frequency of difficulties, they won't all need the same services. I also just want to flag and acknowledge that as we talked about that continuum, you know, we move up and down and some positive things and some mental health support that we can get from our friends and our families and or our, you know, whatever we consider our support and that it is when that severity kind of takes on where we, we, um, we rely on the mental health professionals, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I tend to, there's also the socio-ecological model that we use a lot in the child world, but of course it's the same for adults, which is the person, the individual is at the center of concentric circles around them. Right, so we're all influenced and in who the people that are closest to us are in our outer circle, right? Our family, our loved ones, the larger circle above that that envelops them are the communities in which we live in, our work community, our religious, spiritual communities. And then of course, the larger circle is the cultural and the policies around them. So all of these interplay with our well-being to provide protective or promotive factors for, for our mental health and well-being. Great. Okay, so while we strive to do work that's helpful to the people we serve, at minimum, we have to make sure that people are not harmed by our actions. And this includes emotional, physical, economic, social, and environmental injury. So we mitigate unintentional harm by practicing within the scope of our role, by doing work for which we are appropriately trained, educated, or licensed to do, and we receive sufficient supervision or consultation to help monitor the quality of work we perform. But do no harm also includes being aware of the impact of our own mental and physical health on our, our ability to safely, competently, compassionately work. There is an asymmetry of power inherent in our work. We need to understand the effects of power 
within the structures in which we work and the society overall. Because sometimes it's better to not act or do anything rather than risking harm. Okay, next slide. So here's a question. Do our family and cultural backgrounds influence our understanding of mental health and well-being? A is yes, B is no, and C is not sure. Okay, that was an overwhelming yes. Great. Yes, um, so culture can be defined in many ways, like knowledge, attitudes, roles, or worldview, um, the historical context that's shared by a group of people. It's important to note that people can be part of multiple cultures at one time. Yeah. So for example, someone could be part of their ethnic culture also a religious culture that have opposite values. So people can be part of a certain culture and find differences based on generation or be member of another culture due to a shared identity, such as being LGBTQ, LGBTQIA+. Okay, so let's look at all of these variables at play when we think about culture and context as it relates to the refugee experience, trauma and culture. So just to emphasize that not all cultures respond the same way to trauma. There'll be cultu culturally accepted norms for what it means to be well or unwell. We have to think very deeply about the history of repeated and ongoing trauma exposure. So we really want to increase our self-awareness of our reactions and challenge ourselves to really think about our own cultural frameworks, identities, and the society that we live in because how you integrate trauma-informed care into your work has to reflect gender, culture, and history. For example, safely walking home at night looks very different based on gender. Police interactions look very different depending on the color of your skin or your history with the police and what role they play in your country of origin. Okay, next slide. So, it's impossible to kind of detail an exact approach that would honor the many different cultural identities, but there are some guiding principles that can be helpful. One way to think about culture is to consider how we're building relationships. Are we being responsive to people's worldview? If we aren't sure what an expression means, do we ask? Do we give opportunities to consider differences in the dominant and non-dominant cultures like individualism or collectivism? And when we talk about individualism, it's not just that people value achievement and individual success in some societies. It's that the very way we define our reality and our sense of self is different. Many people from around the world experience well-being through a relationship. Right? Not everyone has such an intense focus on our inner thoughts. The way we manage mental health um, in, in America is often rooted in a very white Western cultural worldview with this hyper focus on what are we thinking and what are we feeling at every single moment. We just have to be aware that there are other ways people manage distress and even conceptualize mental health and well being. Next slide, please. So, culture affects one's explanatory model. It's a model to explain why emotional distress or problems are happening. Oftentimes we use what's called a biopsychosocial model that considers the biological, psychological, and social factors that contribute to one's emotional and behavioral distress. But many cultures have different explanatory models that include spiritual or historical factors. What someone's explanatory model is dictates how they think something should be solved. So exploring explanatory models gives a lot of really good information about the significance of illness or the experience for that person and their family and helps build an understanding of their wider belief system. For example, in the West, a prevailing approach is this mind-body dualism, this concept that you know, mind and body are two separate entities and they're considered different from a disease standpoint. But most cultures with holistic medicine consider these two entities as the same, and they've worked towards integrating their management. 
So there can be a lack of congruence within our mental health systems. Okay, so let's use a case study to dive into what we just talked about. So Aliyah is a 25 year old woman from Iran. She arrived to the US as a refugee about six months ago. She came with her spouse and her three year old son. She has been having trouble getting out of bed most days and cries several hours a day. Because of this, Aliyah's husband recently quit his job to take care of their son. Aliyah says she has had this problem since she was 15 and her mother used to help her with it, but now she has no one. All right, so from a biopsychosocial explanatory model, what actions might you consider taking to help improve the situation? And feel free to type in the chat or just consider for yourselves. Okay, therapy, I refer to therapy. Maybe go back one slide just so we can see sure. the case. Unpacking what was helpful, asking how her mother was able to help her before. What might she, what does she think might make her feel better? Connecting her to others. I'm sorry, I can't read this quickly. <laughs> Um, asking for help from others. Yeah, a lot around connection to supports to other available um, people in her life. Community member, um, uh, there's folks saying her spouse, um, other help that she can get from a local community, um, <clears throat> connecting her to mothers of young children from her culture to gain some insight connection to local resources. So these are really, really good points. Um, and then again, we wanna direct you to the chat where people are sharing their um, great ideas on how they can, they can connect Aaliyah. Mm -hmm. um, next one is also another discussion question around it. Yeah, so um, imagine you ask Aaliyah what she thinks is causing the problem and she tells you it's a jinn or supernatural being. Now, how might you respond? Great, someone says, tell me more about that. Ask her to tell you more about it. Ask for a clarification. Ask her how it impacts um, her. Mm -hmm. I would ask ways, um, how it would help her combat that. Mm -hmm. Ask how she would have, or her community would have dealt with it. Explore how it's viewed in that culture. These are fantastic. Yeah, a lot of exploring, asking, being curious. Yeah. Spiritual leaders um, who can help. Mm -hmm. Ask for when, where, how, and how often, and how long. These are really, really good and mm -hmm. um, insightful and answers. Find a mental health provider from her culture. Validate her. That's mm -hmm. a really good one. When, when in doubt, you validate, right? Yes. Because we may not know how that impacts them or how that looks different in a cultural view. Introduce her to spiritual healer, validate her experience, and frame mental health assistance as assistance within the symptoms that the gin creates. Mm -hmm. really, really, really good answers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now imagine that you ask Aaliyah what she thinks is causing the problem, and she tells you it was because she did not keep her, she did not keep to her tenets of her religion. She was briefly married before and never properly divorced. So she's worried she's going to hell. How might you respond? Thank you again for your engagement um, through your chat. We appreciate it. Again, we wanna direct you to the chat so that you could see the answers and responses that we may be missing as you're all typing super fast. Be respectful of her belief. 
-hmm. connect her with the leaders and religion. Mm -hmm. Thank her for sharing such a personal um, story. I would do research on any religious um, mentors. Empower her with resources. Always empathize. Be a good listener. Mm -hmm. As you can see from the, the case scenario, we really don't have a blanket um, kind of formula or equation on how to deal with things, right? It's really getting in the moment of what our clients' needs are and really listening and um, using those questions that we talked about earlier, describing what is happening for her, for you, right? What do you think would, be, would make it better? What are ways that could be reminded um, to comfort her? Validate her feelings and concerns because these are her beliefs and that she's truly worried about it. No judgment or telling her this is wrong. Really good answers. Thank you all for your answers. Yeah, these are wonderful because your responses kind of collectively give some insight into kind of what is most important for Aaliyah. Right? What is she experiencing from her lens, from her worldview in terms of her health and illness and even care? So that's, that's fantastic. Any next slide. So, you know, what you all have done and the, the answers, the way you responded was being very culturally informed. You're, you were addressing and attending to her explanatory model. And understanding one's explanatory model is one of the best ways to be the most culturally responsive. So questions that are um, helpful to exploring one's explanatory model can be these four. So describe what, what is happening for you. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What do you think is causing it? What do you think would make it better? And what would you do about this problem if you are in this country? Um, so all what you uh, have responded. So these questions can help decide what to do next as a worker while centering the client's voice and choice for what they think will be helpful. But sometimes the client's explanatory model and your model are different. So in these cases, you'll have to decide how much you act on your own explanatory model. A good rule of thumb is how severe the client is being impacted. But even in those cases, you can walk the middle path by responding with both their explanatory model and with yours. So we refer back to Aaliyah, you know, a worker could lean into her model and say, how could we help you get rid of the gin? And while we're working on doing that, could we visit a doctor and see if there might be a medication that could also help, right? So that way you're, you're kind of walking the, to the two, you're attending to both. Next slide. So the stigma, there are many, many reasons for stigma in mental health. Um, and some of these are connected to explanatory models. For example, in the biopsychosocial model, um, which has a lot of individualism, which is not surprising for our culture, um, but within the model lies the issue, is where the issue lies with the person. And so often the stigma is, well, what's wrong with me? Or why can't I manage this? or even the feeling that one may be flawed or, de or defective in some way. But in other models, it could be that someone has bad karma, they've offended the gods, or that they don't have enough faith in God, which is why they're suffering. All of these have stigma implications. So stigma can come from real systems that people experience, like being sent against their will to a psychiatric hospital. It can come from a lack of systems where there's no good treatment um, available. But stigma and shame play a very large part in how a refugee and a community feels about getting help. For a lot of people in refugee communities, the stoicism or maintaining face or appearing well is very important because discussing a personal problem, a feeling or crying can be seen as a weakness and they're thought of as less than or maybe immature. They can be afraid of how it will look to others if they find out they're getting help. So they hide problems or difficulties like pain until things get very severe and it's hard to function. So stigma plays a role at the individual level with people believing they're incompetent or less than. 
at the societal level with stereotypes and prejudice, discrimination. It can be seen at work where diagnoses are used against people. So, you know, if someone says he is just a schizophrenic, he can't have a job, right? A person is not a schizophrenic, they have a schizophrenia disorder, but that can be used against them in the workplace. Or at the systems level where a diagnosis can stay with a person for a long time through their documentation or their medical records, and that can interfere with their future ability to get insurance coverage. So stigma plays a large role with kind of connected to our explanatory model and the societies that we live in. Next slide. Um, the next slide is actually going to be a quick break, but before we do that, Dr. Song, there's a question that came in. It says, I have a client whose family believes that her illness is caused by possession by a, de a demon. She believes that she has a chemical imbalance. The family wants to conduct a ceremony that involves locking her up and hitting her with um, sticks. They also want to cut her off medicine. She feels she has to choose between the support of her family, culture, and the medicine that has given her some relief. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that is a fantastic example um, of, the, of being respectful towards one's explanatory model um, and the treatments that they believe are necessary, but also being mindful of really just kind of abuse and human rights issues. And the two can, they often play, uh, um, they often intersect. So when we say, when I would say um, to kind of walk that middle line, that balance of having one's, upholding one's explanatory model, that's when we say that the treatment that one believes is, might be useful. Let's say it was, um, you know, doing a, doing a ritual that's non-invasive, um, a kind of a religious healing ceremony, then that's fine because it's non-invasive. There's really not much harm that could come from that. But the, the model that you're describing, the treatment of care that you're describing, where someone believes that, well, we need to lock them in a room and basically abuse them and physically assault them. Well, that is harmful. Um, so we can talk about, you know, the approach that I would take is actually to learn more about what it is that that's useful about that practice. Like, what is it doing when you're locking somebody up and assaulting them? Um, and there are times when I would say, especially at times like this, where you're working with people that, you know, our clients, because they're in distress and despair, there is that asymmetry of power. They're not as empowered to speak on their own behalf. And so I do have a harder line and I'll say, that's actually not appropriate to beat another person, right? We cannot do that. Um, that's not appropriate in this culture, in this context, whatever terms you want to use. But I would say we need to protect the rights of that, of that client. And so we say, you know, I'm sorry, but is there any other type of um, way that you think we could, this person could benefit? And you also though, incorporate what you think might be useful. So if you think medications are necessary, then we discuss that. If you don't think medications are necessary, then you discuss that as well. But for you to have kind of a, a clear understanding from your side of what you believe is really necessary for this person. And also to have a firm line when there is an intervention, regardless of where it comes from, that you know will do harm. So we know that physical abuse and a physical assault will do harm and locking someone up will do harm to a person. So I would have a strong and clearer line on that with respect, of course. But it's a great question, it's a difficult one. Thank you for taking the time to answer that question. Um, just wanna remind you guys that you could use the question um, button to ask your questions um, and we'll have plenty of time in the end, but. Um, your questions are welcome anytime. Um, right now, let's take some time. We know that we've given you a lot of information. Let's take some time to stretch, to get hydrated. Um, so let's take a 30 second break and we'll be uh, back. Thank you.
All right, thank you all for your patience. Um, Beth, you're up next. Thank you so much. I just wanted to spend about five minutes to talk about some of the unique challenges that are inherent to this particular moment in time, but also just inherent um, in resettlement. Because as we think about those challenges, what we can do from that MHPSS perspective, um, how closely we can align to trying to solve those challenges is an important intervention. So if we can go to the next slide. So I'd love, you'll see on here that, that you all can go to slido.com. Um, you can either um, look at this, uh, put in this code or go to Slido and put in this number. I'd love to hear what you all think are some general stressors that refugees, asylees, and other forced uh, migrants might face during resettlement or coming to the United States, even if it's not formal resettlement. Housing and getting a job, yes, financial. For those of you that cannot use the slider, oh, yeah. you're also welcome to put it in the yeah. chat. Thank you. Culture shock, housing, which is definitely highly related to financial language. Oh, weather differences. Yeah, that's really good. I hadn't thought about that, but that can be very profound. Looking at all this medical insurance, microaggressions, racism for sure xenophobia, stereotypes, all of these are great. And one of the reasons that, that, um, that it's important to, and feel free to keep putting in, um, uh, putting in some of these challenges, um, one, one of the reasons it's important to look at these, or a couple of reasons it's important to look at these, is sometimes people will look at trauma and toxic stress as things that have happened in the past. And in particular, people like me that are white, that are born in the United States, and have a bias, whether known or not, with this idea of American exceptionalism, we often think, that things are better now that people are in the United States. And sometimes they aren't better. Sometimes people are safer, but they're not necessarily better. And people face many, many profound stressors and even enduring trauma once they've moved to the United States. And when we look at those things like language, housing, financial, um, transportation, it's important to know this concept of mainstreaming mental health. And that concept means that you can do, psych if you are, first of all, if you are providing English language, if you are providing financial coaching, acknowledging that this can be stressful, normalizing that this can be stressful, and even including coping um, mechanisms into your work is very important in helping promote positive mental health. Move to the next one. Got a couple of these. Okay, now let's talk about the particular time that we are in. Considering the current climate right now, what are some added layers of stress that you all think are happening during resettlement? Oh, I see Donna put right in there COVID, right? Blatant xenophobia, yes. The uh, administration policies and the tenor of the last four years have been very uh, explicit in, um, in blaming people who have immigrated to the US, the political climate of the United States. 
uncertainty, fear for family. Yeah. Oh, social isolation. Yes. The pandemic. White supremacy. There is so much in here that is absolutely resonating with me right now. And I'll also say that one of these added layers of stressors of resettlement too, is that not just on the client side, but also on the worker side, because many people, many staff that are working in this space are also um, experiencing these things. Many have come from the countries of origin of, um, of the people they serve. Um, they also may be um, on the receiving end of um, racism and xenophobia. They also may have people back home that have profound uncertainty, but also as the whole resettlement program is starting to resettle again and starting to resettle again during COVID. Um, we are rebuilding an infrastructure and people are profoundly over deployed and under resourced at this particular moment. So there are some very specific challenges to the, this moment and how we um, look at uh, addressing how we do things during the pandemic and still um, our support staff and clients, how we look at those intersecting identities of people and of staff and how we attend to that, how we respond in the, the moment when we see um, dis um, uh, things like the murder of George Floyd or blatant injustices or the unfolding and tragic crisis in Afghanistan and how we respond in the moment to our staff and to our clients and how we sustain that ongoing support throughout the year is important. And then as well, how we build programming um, that reduces risk and increases perfect protective factors as much as possible. Now, risks, we've talked about this and these correspond to that pyramid we've talked about, is how do we help people meet their basic needs? How do we make them have or help them have a sense of belonging by being welcoming and connecting them to community and doing the work in our community to make sure they are welcome? How do we attend to past trauma? How do we try to attend to loss? All of these things that are risk factors, it's actually through our work and the ability to meet basic needs and to connect people to community into um, bringing forth those strengths and teaching new skills or eliciting old skills, being welcoming, having a sense of belonging, all of those things that are risk factors, it is through our work and the strength of our clients that these can also become protective factors. And just to say, we also may have to build some special programming and considerations um, for people based on some unique identities that they have. LGBTQI plus may need particular um, focus supports. Elders may need particular focus supports, children, women, single mothers, those with disabilities, and those programming may have to be aligned specifically with those needs and may have to be unique. So I'll turn it back over to Tigist. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Dr. Song. Thank you all for um, staying with us. It's now time for our Q&A session. Um, I'll kick us off with a few questions we received. Let me turn my camera back on, there we go. Um, during our pre-registration, most of the questions um, that were asked have hopefully been answered by the webinar. And here are a few questions that we can probably um, answer or farther on. Um, Beth or Dr. Song, if you wanna just 
um, and keep yourself on mute and maybe um, jump in wherever you feel relevant. The first one is, how can we approach the importance of mental health in a culturally responsive manner? Yeah, I can um, take that one, I guess. Um, it's a great, it's a fantastic question. Uh, based on the comments that many of you had to the case, I think you all already understanding you're doing this, you're approaching mental health in a culture informed manner. And I think the thing to focus on would be our communication. So communication requires two parts, the talking and the listening. Now, often we focus on the talking part, like what are we saying? When are we gonna say it? How are we gonna say it? You know, when's the right time? But we need to focus on the listening part and listening is not just hearing and absorbing what people are saying. It's not only just being very present. I mean, it's being present and attentive to the lens through which we hear something. So for example, if I'm having a really bad day and my partner comes home and says, what's for dinner? You know, I can hear that as, oh, he's blaming me, right? But if I'm having a good day, I can hear the same words as like, oh, well, he wants my opinion. You know, let's, let's figure it out. Maybe we'll have something fun together. They're the same exact words, but I just hear and interpret very different things based on the lens through which I'm seeing it at that particular time. It's the, it's the same as our mental health and the mental health of our clients, right? When we hear people talking about how hard things are, so many people automatically filter it and immediately into a diagnosis. And it's happening real time as people are talking. I supervise a lot of therapists and it's very, I see it, how quickly people, it's like how quickly people, um, go to experience, to labeling one's experience. That's human nature to simplify and explain, but we need to watch ourselves. And instead of jumping in with an explanation, we be curious, we ask, we can be ignorant sometimes and have other people teach you. And I think that would be the first step to, um, to, use, to approaching with a culturally informed manner. Thank you, Dr. Spock. Uh, Beth, there's a question specifically for you that says, for Beth, do you have examples of programs in the U.S. who have refugees directing their own support groups to meet their unique needs? Um, yes, I would say that um, increasingly in the U.S., we are getting more diverse mental health providers, so there can be people in positions, um, and luckily we have um, I know of many agencies that have this, that have people who have come from refugee or immigrant backgrounds that are, that are mental health providers. So just wanna say that they're not necessarily distinct and always outside of an agency, but there is a growing movement um, for peer support, which recognizes whether it's in substance abuse, uh, persistent severe, or the experience of being forcibly displaced that when people have that lived experience, they bring something really profound um, to that space that you just don't have if you don't have that lived experience. And so there are training programs um, both formal and informal, like there's a formal one in the state of Oregon and informal um, within some agencies to train peer support workers to provide a level of mental health support. It typically isn't those really specialized services like individualized counseling. It's often more of those focused supports like um, adjustment support groups or um, uh, workshops around a particular topic or um, a new mother's adjustment group. And they often, they may be part of an agency, be employed or volunteered, and they often will receive support from that agency. I also want to say that I have seen community run groups around sewing circles, basket weaving um, uh, circles, dominoes club, um, choirs that have had profound positive mental health outcomes without ever addressing the topic of mental health at all. That I have seen those groups have huge positive benefits 
um, and preventative benefits for many, many people without any sort of quote unquote educational component or delving into the mental health topic. And those are almost always run by people in the community for the community. Thank you. Um, thank you for that answer. And I think there's a few questions that had um, similar um, questions, so hopefully that can apply. Um, I have a question here that says, how can offices who use RHS 15 um, screener implement it and proceed with mental health referrals if needed? So as somebody who was a part of the RHS, I mean, I want to say it's certainly not the only screener out there. And I think the the People have to take a step back first before they even consider screening. Um, what are we going to do once we screen people? Where are they going to go? Is this support meaningful? Does it um, match what clients say they need or they want? And so you really have to have meaningful resources available, a durable referral pathway into those supports. Um, I think before you even start screening. Um, and then when you do screen, you need to really think about what are you screening for? And is this the right tool? The RHS is a great tool to screen for the likelihood that somebody may have anxiety, depression, or PTSD. But, other, but there are times that people may be screening for something different than that, right? Um, and so you really need to pick the tool to make sure that it is the, the right tool for what you want to try to accomplish. And then you need to think about, has it been tested cross-culturally? And does it mean the same thing if it's in another language? And has there been um, a really uh, good, strong process to, um, to translate this tool that actually is, is a contextual translation and not just a word for word translation. So I don't have a very simple answer to that, but I think the screening, um, the whole screening idea is a worthy thing to think about, but it's, it's complex and it goes beyond just, sh you know, should we screen or not screen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really good. Um, there's a practical application um, question here. It says practical application during case management. How to address some basic needs given the shortage of mental health providers? So what do we do when we have shortage of mental health providers within our community? You know, that is the million dollar question I think that everybody <laughs> is dealing with right now. I think we're seeing it right now, of course, in the pandemic where everybody is having mental health needs and there aren't enough um, people, trained people to, to satisfy that need. But around the world, of course, in the humanitarian setting, we've had this issue for you know, forever. There's one um, project I'm doing actually for UNICEF that we, I were, I'm helping to integrate MHPSS into child protection case management. And it's basically, so the framework will roll out, hopefully, I'm gonna try around February of March of 2022. Um, and that will come with a framework of how to integrate MHPSS into let's say case management. Um, but it can be used, I think, across the board for any sort of paraprofessionals or social service workforce and um, people. And we'll have kind of core competencies that people should have because we don't all have to be therapists, right? We can use an MHPSS informed approach in all of our work, no matter what we do, just as anybody can use a trauma informed approach. If you work at the grocery store, if you're a grocery clerk, you can also use a trauma informed approach in your work with that. The same is true with MHPSS, right? So there's some basic core competencies that we can use. And some of that most people have, right? The active listening, establishing rapport and trust, staying present, use a strength-based approach, many of which we talked about in this webinar. But if people want, you can also look at, you know, there's a basic um, basic psychosocial skills that that's out, which I think is very nice. There's Save the Children has a very nice psychological first aid. There's a part one and a part two um, that 
goes over, you know, how to communicate and talk with children and adults in despair and distress in humanitarian settings when there are no other, and we talked about the pyramid again, when there are no level three or four service providers. Um, there's also foundational helping hands that I think is also a really nice document that gives some just basic skills that we all could benefit from. I also want to flag um, Hyas's group model that I know we um, have recommended in our resources, so you guys can look into that. Um, but I don't know if you had something to say uh, or to add. If not, I can move to the next question. No, I don't think so. I mean, I think that it is whether it's it's definitely profound in the humanitarian um, in humanitarian settings um, that dearth of resources, but there's a great dearth within the US as well. And I think that just as Dr. Song said, that that's why we want to try to both mainstream these mental health approaches, these MHPSS approaches, and also recognize um, the other types of things that are often meaningful to clients that can be built. And this is also where when we're operating um, programs or agencies hearing from the clients um, and budgeting resources so that we can empower them to start things that are meaningful that from their in their community can be incredibly important, cost effective, and with a huge impact as well. Thank you. Um, I have, uh, let's see, there's a few that just popped up right before I read the one that I was going, okay. It says, um, I have a client who refuses to take medication because she believes her illness came from family members who sent her um, evil spirit. She does not want to meet to see a doctor because she does not know what she's going to go through. She insists only prayers can save her. What role can, uh, what role can uh, religious people, pastors, priests, um, play to help this client get services that can help her? Yeah, so I can take that one. So I um, I love this question because it's such a common and very real question and one that I often encountered um, in my work. So one of the, the reasons why working with refugee communities are is just wonderful is because you really get to work with the community. You really get to work um, within kind of the context in which people are living, we have to. If we're going to work with refugees, we have to do that. So that means we go to the mosques, right? We go into the temples, we work with the monks, we talk with the imams, right? And we do joint sessions with them if possible. So I, I did that a few times where, you know, I would meet with the imam just individually for a few times or with the monks individually a few times and you help empower them and you, it's this bi direct, as we talked about earlier in this webinar, this is bi directional education that happens. So we are learning from them what their beliefs are, what their thoughts are, and how it can be helpful. And they learn from us what our beliefs are. And together, it's almost like a, it's really powerful when you have that relationship, that connection, because then you just serve the community so much in, more, in a more accepting and deeper way um, when we all collaborate. So I would really encourage people to, to build those relationships, long-standing relationships with the community. Thank you. There's a question that I'm not quite sure, but I think I'll give it a go. It says, can a third party benefit from this treatment too? I'm assuming they're referring to MHPSS or the pyramid. If it's not clear, we can skip to the next question. <laughs> I think that I'm not quite sure how to answer this, but one thing I'm thinking about is um, when we have, if we treat a parent, if a parent improves, whether or not they're treated or not, um, but if we see a move on that continuum to more positive mental health, consistently we're going to see a benefit to the children in that home. So I think that there, when you are looking at improving the well-being of of anyone, generally you're improving the well-being of 
assist them as well. All right, thank you. I think we'll take one last question, which I see here, and then we'll conclude. Please, in my practice as a therapist, I've been asked to be um, a couples therapist or a mediator for couples or families that have domestic violence um, present in the relationship, which is not clinically sound. How might you approach this? Um, the person says, um, I'm always looking for better ways to respond to this request. Dr. Son, you wanna take this as a therapist? <laughs> or Beth, one of you guys? <laughs> Sure. Yeah, this one is, um, these are the cases that are a bit heartbreaking. So, um, so the question, if I'm hearing it properly, I'm sorry, it's a little muffled, but the question is around um, how to address when someone wants couples therapy, but that one member is abusing the other. There's domestic abuse. Yes, there's a domestic violence um, present and are asked to be a, a couples therapy within the same dynamic. Got it. So, um, you're right in that it is not clinically sound to see a couple if there is active violence going on. Um, if you can, I always try to see that person individually. And if you can't, if that if the partner or the spouse or whoever won't allow that, um, then you get the phone number, if possible, of the person and hope that they have access to their own phone line that you can contact them. Or this is when I really try to expand the circle. So if there are ever times when you're feeling like, oh no, I don't know what to do. This is like, I, I'm stuck. I have nothing else to do. I don't know where to go. I expand the circle. Either you expand it on your side with maybe now is a time, you know, for me, you know, I'm a psychiatrist. So I definitely join with my, the therapist or the case managers, the case workers on board. And we kind of get a team approach but also from that client side, right? So the client has, you know, we can ask that client, well, who else is in the social, who else is, are in your circles, your inner circle? So we have whoever this partner is. Are there any other siblings, family members, friends, religious figures, community, anybody else in your life that we can also draw on and, and kind of start to envelop them into our work so that you're not feeling alone as a clinician, but also we're emphasizing to the client that they aren't alone either in this horrible situation. Thank you, Dr. Song. Thank you, Beth. Um, we have come to the end of our webinar. These are the learning objectives um, from today's training and we hope that you can now or you have achieved them. Um, we'll also share and email the list of recommended resources along with the link to the recording that I know Rebecca has um, um, put in the chat. Before signing off, I hope you'll take a very short moment to complete our feedback survey. This survey takes less than a, a minute and it's incredibly helpful for us to improve um, our future training. So we really appreciate it if you could take a minute to do that. Um, again, Rebecca is dropping the link and um, you should see that in the chat. Depending on how you join this webinar today, the survey itself may already be open in, in your web um, browser. If not, please click on the chat and you should be able to access it. Again, here are the uh, recommended resources. We'll be emailing this, emailing this out as well. Um, and finally, here's um, Switchboard's contact information. I do hope that you'll stay in touch with us and um, again, join us for future trainings. If you haven't um, subscribed, please uh, subscribe so that you are notified of Switchboard's um, upcoming trainings. Thank you so much again for joining today and a huge, huge thanks to today's speakers, Beth Farmer and Dr. Susan Song and to my co-host, Rebecca. Thank you again and have a good day.